All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the One Health Podcast. I'm your host, Tori Schmelzer. I'm a fitness enthusiast slash fitness entrepreneur. My goal is to share the knowledge I gather through meeting industry experts with as many people as I can. Welcome back for another week. Uh, we want to thank those of you who've shown us love on iTunes, on Spotify, on Facebook, Instagram. We really do appreciate that. Uh, for those who are new to the show, each week we are going to bring on experts in different areas of health. So that could be physical health, mental health, professional health, spiritual health, you name it, we cover it. We don't claim to be experts in any of these subjects. We just know the people who are and we interview them for the greater good. Um, shout out to our sponsors, Eco Gym and Motivating You. Make sure you guys go to shop.team. Motive, the number eight, the letter N and the letter U.com, and sign up for your free macro plan today. All listeners are going to receive that special offer, so act now. Also, Eco Gym, these guys are giving away a week free of their revolutionary group fitness classes called Surge that are going to change the way you guys think about group fitness. They're also doing red light therapy, hyperbaric therapy, tanning, smoothies, meals, supplements, you name it. They have it covered, so make sure you guys go to ecogymworldwide.com, sign up for your free seven-day pass now. All listeners are going to receive discounted enrollment through the end of this month. Uh, today on the show, we have a truly amazing individual joining us, Dr. Eric Shahab from the Illinois Bone and Joint Institute. Dr. Shahab, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, to give you guys a little bit of background on Dr. Shahab, he is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in sports medicine. He provides general fracture care, but specializes in the treatment of sports-related injuries, in particular the knee and the shoulder. Dr. Shahab provides advanced treatments for anterior cruciate ligament injuries, shoulder injuries, including rotator cuff and uh, shoulder instability and soft tissue and bone trauma. Uh, graduated from Harvard and Stanford and completed his orthopedic surgery resident residency at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City, which is recognized by U.S. News and World Report as the nation's number one hospital for orthopedics. Did I, is that it? I'm That's sure it. That, <laughs> just Harvard and Stanford, no big deal. Uh, I just want to make sure I didn't leave anything out there. No. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So I guess start us off here. What made you go down this path, um, uh, your journey into medicine, this industry? What made you kind of gravitate towards that? So um, probably my mom, who's a nurse, when I was growing up, I was always exposed to the medical community. She's um, She practiced as a, a medical assistant in um, an ob in office, and so I would meet the docs and um, and then I played sports and I got hurt and I met a bunch of orthopedists the hard way. And um, when I was uh, uh, in seventh grade, I had injured my ACL actually at a pretty young age and didn't really recognize it at the time, but that's definitely what it was. And so I got exposed to orthopedics at um, a young age the hard way. And then um, through college and sports and everything else, um, I, I always thought I was going to go into medicine. But um, uh, And then once I was in medicine, it just seemed like a natural fit to be in involved with sports medicine and orthopedics because I love sports and I love um, love the ability to fix things in orthopedics. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, I was just kind of curious. Yeah. yeah. I, I, always, I always like to ask people to give a little background on that. What does Illinois Bone and Joint Institute do for those out there that aren't in the area? So we're a multi-specialty orthopedic practice that covers um, every subspecialty within orthopedics that you can think of. So we... Um, um, we provide coverage for trauma to long bones, femur fractures, tibia fractures, humerus fractures. We have um, subspecialists in hand surgery, spine surgery. We have sports medicine uh, specialists like myself who specialize in um, joint reconstructions and um, ligament instability, both around the knee and the shoulder most commonly. We have arthroplasty surgeons who do uh, a majority of our hip and knee replacements. And um, we have foot and ankle specialists uh, dealing with um, conditions and injuries to the foot and ankle. So um, basically, um, we provide top-to-bottom comprehensive coverage for um, orthopedic conditions and injuries, about everything you can think of. That's awesome. And you guys are doing a um, – I noticed when I was there today, I went and I got introduced to you. You guys offer a – is it a 24-hour kind of like emergency 
I, thankfully, it's not 24 hours for okay. our sake. It would drive everybody <laughs> nuts. But we provide um, uh, an ortho access clinic is what we call it from okay. um, nine to nine in the morning till late at night on most weekdays. Fridays, it's a little bit shorter till about um, six at night. And then on the weekends for eight to noon on Saturday and from 12 to five on Sundays. And it's a, a means for a lot of um, patients used to go to the emergency room if they injured their ankle, their wrist, um, had an injury to their shoulder. And they'd basically get an x-ray in the emergency room. They'd be told to go to the orthopedist, and they'd get a bill for 500 bucks. And so we provide um, uh, orthopedic uh, specialists, orthopedic um, uh, musculoskeletal specialists to evaluate the patients and treat them right then and there for the price of a typical office visit. Okay. So um, it's been incredibly well received by our community, and um, you know it's basically grown by word of mouth. And um, uh, even the ERs are quite thankful because we sort of decompress the overload yeah. that they have there. So it's been um, it's been a win 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 all around for us, for our patients, and for the community. You think a, a lot of uh, the I guess your industry is going to start to shift a little bit more towards that. Are you guys are you guys kind of revolutionary with this, or has this been happening across the nation a little bit? So the, we're probably one of the um, largest and earliest groups into this field. Um, there's a very large group in Carolina called Ortho Carolina that's similar to Illinois Bone and Joint um, in terms of its size and scope, and they ha- also have a um, access clinic for patients with more acute injuries. And I think most practices are developing um, some sort of um, access. But we're definitely on the forefront of this. We've been doing this for several years now. And again, it's been incredibly well received by our patients. And um, I think the community is very grateful that it's there. I think it's, it's genius. Why not save save people the time, save people the money? It's, it's kind of a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. I like that. I like that. So you specifically, what are the most common injuries that you deal with? On a daily basis that you're seeing? So the most common injuries I see are to the knee and to the shoulder. Okay. And if we start with the knee, um, the knee pain is a frequent um, diagnosis that people come to the office and to be evaluated. Um, and there's several different causes of knee pain. In the younger folk, it's usually some from an injury or from overuse or from tendinopathy. And in the older patients, um, not infrequently, it's a degenerative condition where the knee is simply starting to wear down and they're... Um, Exceeding the limits that the knee is capable of, of, of that, that the knee is capable of. Um, when it comes to um, the knee injuries in the younger patients, uh, many of them involve ligament injuries from an injury. So we will see injuries to the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. We'll see ligaments to the medial collateral ligament. Um, those are the most common ligament injuries we see. Sometimes we see combined ligament injuries, which are a much more serious deal. And um, and then also, obviously, to the meniscus, it's a very uh, commonly injured um, structure in the knee. And in younger folks, it usually represents an acute injury. Uh, patients who are older who have meniscus problems, that's actually quite common. You take anybody who's 50 years and above, and there's actually a reasonable chance if you MRI their knee, even if they didn't have any symptoms, that they would have meniscus problems or a, a finding of a meniscus without problems. So um, in general... Um, uh, for the knee and the young, it's ligament injuries, meniscus injuries, sometimes cartilage injuries, sometimes fractures. In the elder, and not the elderly, but in the older athlete, it's typically um, patients who have some degenerative conditions or a fracture or some of those acute ligament injuries, but they're just simply not as common because they're not exposed. They don't have the injury exposure risk that um, a younger person has. So break down for our listeners that aren't familiar with how the knee is structured. So I know you have an ACL and an MCL, and there's an PCL? Correct. So um, there are four, we talk about four main stabilizers of the knee. And on the inside of, of the knee is the medial collateral ligament, or the MCL. And that runs from the femur to the tibia, and it's a very broad, strong ligament. It typically does not require surgery when it's injured, but it requires a significant amount of time for recovery. So not uncommonly, six to eight, six to 12 weeks for recovery. There's the lateral collateral ligament on the outside of the knee. It's parallel to the MCL. Um, and that, um, that ligament is not as frequently injured simply because it's harder to get a force across the knee that um, will injure it. But when it is, it's relatively similar to the MCL in terms of its healing capacity. It's when you get inside the knee that the, um, the cruciate ligaments, and cruciate stands for cross, um, these two ligaments cross right in the middle of the knee. And the uh, anterior cruciate ligament provides rotatory stability to the knee. So when patients tear their anterior cruciate ligament, they typically have rotational instability um, at um, unpredictable moments in their life if they go forward in their lives without the ACL. 
And we so do that, have so that's yes. cut, like moving left to right or something. Yeah, like, if they're cutting, kind of, changing okay, direction, or okay. I, I talk about acceleration and deceleration injuries. If you're accelerating and changing direction, cutting, um, and you don't have an ACL, you will be at risk for the knee being unstable. If you're jumping and landing, um, again, that's a deceleration. You will be at risk for the ACL being. Uh, if the ACL is injured, you will be at risk for instability. Um, the posterior cruciate ligament's more forgiving. Um, and athletes not infrequently can tear their PCL and still perform at a very high level without having surgery or reconstruction. But a posterior cruciate ligament uh, injury does require um, rehabilitation, quadriceps strengthening uh, to compensate for the missing ligament. That's more of a translational um, injury so that the tibia tends to sag a little bit backwards. So it's more of a front to back. But patients don't feel unstable. It's not that rotatory instability yeah. that you get when the anterior cruciate ligament gets torn. So um, the, the biggest um, ligament instability injury that causes problems in the knee and the most common that everyone hears about is the anterior cruciate ligament. And then the meniscus is, is, it, is that just cartilage inside there? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a rimming uh, cartilage that is made out of the same material as your nose and your earlobe. It's okay. that flexible cartilage. And it basically recontours the top of the knee. The top of the knee is essentially flat. So on the top of the tibia or the tibial plateau, it's flat. And the femur is rounded on the end within the knee. And so that meniscus cartilage basically contours that flat tibia to match the rounded femur. So when you're moving your knee, um, you're distributing the forces. Now, because it's a soft, flexible cartilage, if you load it and twist it, you can rip it. And um, that's what a meniscus tear is. Okay. Um, the problem with the meniscus tear is when you lose meniscus, you have less of that um, padding, less of that distribution of force. And so you can start wearing down the knee more quickly. So um, uh, though meniscus injuries are easy to recover from for young people, it's, um, it's not a good injury to have because it's probably going to age your knee prematurely in the long run. So can you guys go in and put something in there? Like let's say you're an older individual. Can you go in there and – Add, I guess you can't add more meniscus or artificial something in there to help with that grinding. Well, it's you're you're kind of hitting on the holy grail of of what we seek, which is a um, a meniscus substitute for patients who lose their meniscus, or a way of 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 regenerating meniscus, or a way of preserving meniscus when it's been torn. And we unfortunately have relatively limited ability to do that. There are some meniscal scaffolds that are in development, which are basically the idea of having some um, um, matrix, some protein matrix that you can then put in a patient's cells and have those cells repopulate the area to, to make a, a native artificial meniscus. Um, there's 3D printing involved with some of this um, in order to create the scaffold to match your knee or my knee. And um, so this is in development, but um, it's a very difficult problem to solve because the knee is such a mechanically harsh environment. The knee translates, it rotates, it gets loaded. And so tissue gets um, under tremendous pressure and it rips. And for, it's amazing that the biology is such that it can be maintained for as long as it is. Yeah. Um, but over time, um, that biology just isn't able to keep up with the demands. And that's where patients start developing these degenerative conditions of their knee. And if we can find an answer, we're kind of um, on the same quest as Ponce de Leon was when he was looking for the fountain of youth. You know, we're, we're looking for that sort of molecular mechanical fountain of youth for the knee. Got it. It's crazy. I figured, I thought you were going to tell me that there is something that they've developed out there. It's crazy that it's 2018 and we haven't quite... It's, it's a really difficult problem to solve. Yeah. There are um, meniscal transplants. So in other words, um, we can take a meniscus from a cadaver and put it oh. into a... Um, patient, but they, um, securing it and having it be viable and having it be mechanically correct for the knee, again, it's, it's very, very challenging. So, um, um, you know, despite the fact that it's right there, like we know what we need to do, it still remains a big challenge. And so hmm. not uncommonly when patients do have meniscus injuries, um, some of your best treatments are your most low tech treatments, physical therapy, icing, strengthening, and having the muscles help take some of the force off the knee so that um, the meniscus can be compensated for, the injured meniscus can be compensated for. Are you, so what are you guys doing? Do you do any like total knee replacements? Do so I, 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 I do a handful of total knee replacements. We've all trained doing okay. total knee replacements. I've done uh, seemingly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of total knee replacement through training. Uh, my special interest in practice is more for the ligament reconstructions. Okay. But with total knee replacement, um, 
people have a misconception that we're basically cutting out the knee and putting in a hinge. When in fact, what we're doing is we're sort of uh, shaving away the cartilage and putting a metal cap over it so that we're protecting the ends of the bone. So when the, okay. the, the hard cartilage, not the meniscus cartilage, there, there's two types of cartilage in the knee. There's the hard cartilage that is at the end of the femur and at the top of the tibia. And then there's that soft cartilage, the meniscus that pads in between. Um, but when that hard cartilage wears down, the bone gets exposed to all the forces and the bone just doesn't tolerate it very well. So a knee replacement puts a metal cap where the cartilage used to be on the femoral side. And then we can make um, basically a tray on the tibial side, a new tibial plateau with specially designed plastic essentially to allow for more normal motion of the knee. So um, again, there's a misconception that we, we cut out the knee and put it in a hinge when in fact we're doing more of a resurfacing procedure within the knee. Okay. How long? So I, I'm astonished by these professional, especially football and basketball players who get this ACL surgery and it seems like they bounce back so fast. What is the recovery time for like an average person on an ACL like surgery? So, um, we, six months is a number that we hang our hat on for, um, the average recovery, but at six months, patients are not fully recovered. Okay. Um, and even the athlete at six months, the professional athlete isn't recovered at six months. And uh, many of the athletes are taking between nine and 12 months to fully return to sport at um, a level, at that professional level. Um, the, um, the ACL takes about a, when you, when you, when someone has an ACL injury, first of all, uh, we don't sew the ACL back together. We actually remove the tissue and use other tissue from the knee to make a new ACL. So the surgery is called an ACL <laughs> reconstruction. Okay. And with that reconstructed tissue, it takes time for it to become, um, for it to become a new ACL. And that process, when we look at it by um, uh, sampling tissue even and, and looking at it over time with MRI, it takes about a year for it to fully mature. And for athletes who are going back before that year, They've typically developed enough muscle strength, enough um, neuromuscular reflexes that they're able to protect the knee with that. Um, after a year, the ACL is what's protecting the knee. Okay. Um, but it's a um, it's it's a great operation because without it, many patients will suffer from instability. But it's still not a perfect operation because not everybody's able to make it back to fully participating in sports, and not everybody obtains stability for the rest of their life. So um, the perfect operation would be one that has no side effects, um, works on everybody, and um, everybody bounces back instead of in 9 to 12 months and 9 to 12 days. I mean, um, yeah. so we, we still have some work to do on that front. I've One of our trainers here, actually, uh, is a big soccer player, and he blew out his ACL three times. He came back twice, blew it out a third time, and then that was it for him for soccer. Mm -hmm. How many times are you seeing reoccurring injuries after you guys do these surgeries with these athletes? So it's a great question. Um, the recurrence rate um, is generally around um, 5 to 10%, okay. the re-injury rate, That's which is low. relative. Well, it's actually pretty is high. high. Yeah, I, oh, I, okay. I hate to think of it. Uh, there was a study that was done looking at West Point cadets who uh, went to West Point having had their ACLs reconstructed, and they followed them along through their West Point careers. And um, there was about a 10% re-injury rate um, among the West Point cadets. Now, granted, they're jumping out of airplanes, they're playing uh, high-level sports, they're putting their knees under tremendous stress. Um, but anywhere between 5 to 10% is a number that's um, a reasonable number for a very athletic uh, person. Um, th uh, that's the risk of re-injury. Interestingly, the other knee is probably at slightly higher risk for injury than the one that was reconstructed. Because of overcompensation, or I, it may be just a predisposition. Once you have an ACL injury, hmm. there may be anatomic factors that make um, the other knee equally as susceptible. Interesting. Yeah, I've always wondered that because you'll hear. I mean, you know, locally, Derek Rose, Chicago Bulls. I mean, he was famous for knee issues too, mm -hmm. and just kept happening and kept happening and kept. As from a doctor's perspective. What, have you seen someone three times, four times before the same person that's done that? So um, I, I, the, the most I've seen is someone who's torn their native ACL once and their surgery twice. Okay. So um, and that's a and that's actually someone who was referred in. And the, the, it's just a terrible problem. At some point, um, 
the knee is just going to have to function probably without an ACL because when they get to that point, there's a lot of stretch of the secondary stabilizers of the knee. So you can put a new ACL in there, but you're asking it to do an awful lot. And so sometimes those patients have to um, either modify their activities or put up with some uh, minor instability. Um, fortunately, you know, the braces have become much more comfortable to wear and uh, more comfortable to use. So you can still be active. And many patients who are ACL insufficient, who don't have one or have a reconstruction that didn't work, can still do straight ahead activity at a pretty high level. Okay. So you can run, swim, bike without an ACL, become the world's best triathlete without an ACL. I mean, these are still some goals for wow. people. Again, it's that acceleration, deceleration, cutting, jumping, landing. That's where you're putting a lot of strain on the ACL. So if you get in that situation where you have a multiply injured knee, multiply injured ACL knee, then you can modify the activity, still be very active, but you'd be avoiding the cutting, jumping type sports. Is it tough from a doctor's perspective to have a conversation with somebody that, you know, hey, maybe it's time to hang it up? Yeah, no, no one wants to tell anybody to throw in the towel. And, and, and our job is to help patients not throw in the towel. But we also need to be realistic and think long term in some situations where right. if we feel that the harm um, is greater than the benefit, then obviously um, we need to give that advice. And it's never easy to deliver, but it's certainly um, in the patient's best interest. Got it. One other thing you mentioned was uh, shoulder issues, mm -hmm. specifically rotator cuff things. And I'm just curious from my perspective, I've had shoulder issues. Um, I think that stems from not being trained properly on how to lift, uh, you know, previously back in high school, you know, you have the uh, weight room uh, football coaches that have no qualifications that don't know what they're doing. Are you seeing um, a lot of rotator cuff injuries on like younger people as so, well. So it's interesting. So rotator cuff issues typically occur in people in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. It's, it's an injury that tends to occur more in the older athlete. Uh, the younger athletes hurt their shoulders by overloading it, but will typically hurt the cartilage structures within the shoulder, similar oh, to the okay. knee. So they tend to hurt their labrum pretty frequently. They can have some rotator cuff inflammatory problems from poor form, poor technique. But uh, the younger folks uh, who are in their 20s um, rarely are um, fully tearing their rotator cuff like um, someone my age in their um, late 40s, early 50s. So um, what we see a lot of is, like you're mentioning, like you're alluding to, is poor technique leading to injury. Um, and that usually is to um, the joint itself and is to the labrum as okay. most commonly. Um, I was at a meeting with um, a group of sports medicine doctors, and one of the docs who takes care of... Um, of Arizona State said that they lost more time to injury from weight room injuries than they did from on the field injuries. So when you're talking about proper training, I mean, that's exactly the point. And, you know, obviously if, if there are that many weight room injuries, something needs to change about the approach to lifting weights to help um, the, the athletes, number one, perform well, but number two, prevent injury. And if it's causing injury, that, that something's obviously got to give. I think I think it's getting a little bit better now as people coming out of people coming out of school and going back to their hometown to coach the high school football team. I think they're a lot more qualified now than they were back when I was in high school or, or you were in high school. But I mean, I still even hear it sometimes today where parents will bring their kids over to us and there's two local high schools by us and they're saying I would I'd feel a little more comfortable with my student working with someone who's gone to school for four years for kinesiology or has a nationally accredited certification that knows what they're doing. And I wish from my standpoint, too, that I had hired somebody, you know, back in high school or my parents would have pushed me more towards that because I feel like I would have been much further along. So, yeah, I just I see that all the time. And yeah, like I said, personally, from my standpoint, I, I, you know, I feel issues in my shoulder. And some of these young kids that come in here are saying the same thing. And I'm just like, oh, God, I wish we could have got to you guys a little sooner, you know? Yeah, I, I, I think it raised a, a very good point, a very interesting point. I, I, I think the way kids lift in school for performance is all based on strength. And so they're basically trying to lift as much as they can, as many times as they can. And that's a recipe for injury. Yep. So um, if they can learn to lift with purpose, and I think this is something that um, could actually be taught in a phys ed class and would be incredibly valuable in a phys ed class of lifting for flexibility, lifting for endurance, lifting for power, and, and breaking it down and teaching the kids that there are ways to use the weights so that you can gain flexibility 
gain strength, uh, gain um, endurance, and minimize the risk of injury. And you know, I, it is an education in of itself. I, when I was a high schooler and a, a high school athlete, we would put as much weight on the bar as we could <laughs> not get pinned under, and we'd try and lift yeah. it as many times as we could, and we'd typically get off and rub our shoulders, and <laughs> we were idiots. And I don't think it's changed a single bit, and yeah. I think it probably comes with the Y chromosome. I mean, the bottom line is we're guys, and you get in a weight room, and that's the type of thing that happens. But it Seriously. definitely is an area of, of, of physical education that is undertaught and not understood very well. So if you get that message out, um, uh, bravo to you, because yeah. that's a, a really important message. We see a lot of weight room related injuries that mm-hmm. could have been prevented um, that were with the, with all good intention. I mean, I, that, those football coaches and strength and conditioning oh, yeah. coaches working with a high school athlete, their intentions are great, but I think they need to lift with purpose. And um, again, with certain goals in mind that go beyond, I'm going to um, build quote unquote strength by lifting as much as I can as many times as I can. I think for us, we teach, we preach a lot of, I know some of our trainers do a lot of uh, time under tension things. So not going so fast, so quickly to get as many reps as you can, but maybe coming down like you're bench pressing, coming down and having it take five or six seconds till it touches your chest and then come up. You can have a lot less weight on that bar and come down and still, you're probably getting more out of the workout. Yeah, I think um, yeah. I think a lot of the times when you watch um, the high school kids lift weights, they're using the momentum of the bar, so they're not engaging the muscle. And so, if you can engage the muscle throughout the cycle, um, you can get a, an equally good pump, an equally good fatigue, an equally good workout with a much lower risk of injury. And that's what needs to be taught. And um, equally as important is the training. Uh, equally as important as the training that's being done is the recovery between workouts. And I think that's often overlooked. Um, I think there's insufficient time for recovery. And um, when athletes start focusing on their recovery, it's amazing at how it influences their training in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I think the message of focusing on recovery first will actually dictate the type of training that you do and will significantly reduce risk for injury. I think all the greats are spending millions of dollars. You hear about Tom Brady, LeBron James. I read something. It was like $4 million a year he spends just on post-recovery, post-workout recovery. Yeah, the, the NBA had to get savvy to this because um, they were, you know, they had a public relations disaster when they'd have these back-to-back-to-back games. And let's say the Lakers were coming into Chicago this year on whatever date it is, and some kid buys their ticket to see LeBron play with the Lakers, but LeBron's played in Cleveland, Milwaukee, and then Chicago back to back to back and takes a rest. You know, that that was a disaster waiting to happen. But the athlete needed the rest, and so the NBA became savvy. They really tried to limit their um, back-to-backs. They also have um, contracts with some of these recovery apps, um, uh, the wearable devices that um, allow for recovery, like Whoop.com. Or, or are you familiar with some of these? Uh, yeah, I've heard of some of them. Whoop was that was the one that I've. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I, I, I think I think some of these recovery apps have a lot of um, value. I don't have one. I don't know these well enough to say that one's yeah. better than the next. Yeah. We'll have a, have a kid with an elbow with elbow pain, and. Um, you know, the, the idea that Tommy John works on everybody and can be used as a prophylactic um, gets somehow into their minds. Um, the fact of the matter is it's still a salvage procedure, and it's not used as prophylaxis and shouldn't be. And uh, the tissue that gets put in there is stronger than the native tissue, which is why patients can recover. But it's not 100% recovery. Many people make it back, but many people don't. So um, it's about a 90% success rate of, of coming back to pitching, which is very, very good for a salvage type procedure, but it's not 100%. Yeah. So having someone get a ligament just in case would, means you're exposing them to a 10% risk that they're not going to throw again. So I don't know any surgeon who's doing it. And the people who are doing it, I think if you put them in front of a board of orthopedic surgeons would probably be kicked out of the out of the academy. So um, I, I, ha- I know of no physicians in this area who would take on um, a athlete to prophylactically do a Tommy John surgery, though I'm sure they are out there. I know no of them. None, none of them. Yeah, I, know, I, know, I, none I was curious because yeah. I always heard that and it made me kind of sick. I'm like, uh, why, why, why? Well, I again, guess. I think it's just misinformation and um, combined with good intentions, actually. So I, 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 I get it, but um, I certainly 
um, I, I come across this and I am very, very adamant in my saying, this is not something you should even consider. Do not go down this road. You will not find anybody who does this in our area. And if you do, you shouldn't be going to them anyway. So um, <laughs> that's, 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 that's the way I approach it when um, that parent comes in. What uh, what's some advice you can give to um, some parents out there? You have kids that are in, you know, basketball, soccer, football. Are there things that they can be doing to maybe avoid some of these injuries or things that they can be working on to strengthen or work on to help prevent them at all? You know, it's interesting. I, I think one of the things that's driven the injury rate higher among athletes, and this is a there is a youth sports epidemic of injuries, um, is the hyper specialization and year round participation in a single sport. And we see it um, every day of overuse injuries that are occurring from um, this hyper specialization. Um, the thing that I advise pa- parents is. Try to expose your kids to multiple sports. The seasonality of sports that we grew up with actually has a musculoskeletal benefit, um, and there's a there's a, a there's an academy. The orthopedic community there's an, a sports medicine society called the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. When James Andrews, who's the orthopedist to the stars, he did Adrian Peterson's knee. You see him on Sports Center. Everybody seems to know Dr. Andrews. Um, he started a. Um, a campaign called StopSportsInjuries.org. And the motto of it was uh, keep kids on the playing field for life. And he had been seeing an epidemic of shoulder injuries, elbow injuries, knee injuries, particularly from baseball, um, from this hyper-specialization year-round participation in sports. So parents, I frequently will refer to StopSportsInjuries.org. Okay. Um, which is a resource um, for parents to learn how to minimize the risk uh, of injury. Some of the pearls are one sport per season and one league per sport. Um, you want to have a day off a week and a month off a year. And, and just these simple mottos can help minimize um, these injuries. And then finally, um, on StopSportsInjuries.org, there are sport-specific injury uh, prevention tips. Okay. So if you go to baseball, you'll see pitch counts. If you go to soccer, you'll see... Um, equipment uh, um, and, and, and cleat wear and so just the and, and practice how, how much you want to be practicing because we see a lot of kids who are going from their soccer practice to their basketball practice in the same day and clearly violating just that first rule of thumb of one sport per season and one league per sport. So um, th- these kids aren't professional athletes, and if even the professional athletes don't work like this, the professional athletes don't <laughs> go to three practices a day. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, um, that's probably the biggest challenge is 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 managing that and and helping parents understand what exposes their kids to injury and what um, can help them prevent that. It's just unfortunately, there's this misconception that more the better, the more you do, the better the performance. when in fact, again, this is why I'm trying to focus on recovery. Yeah. Um, if you start focusing on recovery, it simply limits um, the volume of training you're going to do and and that's super helpful at preventing injuries. Yeah, I know. Back in my day, it was you did, you know, you had a football season, you had a track season, and then you had a baseball season. And there was breaks in between there. And you had months where you where they were doing voluntary workouts. And I think we've gotten away from that. They're voluntary workouts, but really they're kind of mandatory if, if you want to play, you well, know? Well, forget the three-sport athlete, which is a dying breed in this area. It's And these are very large high schools. There are 4,000 kids at, at these high schools in our area. So um, making the team is hyper competitive. Mm-hmm. And um, so it certainly drives the kids to want to become expert in a single sport because if you're not, you'll have no prayer of making your high school team. And so, um, you know, if the high schools were smaller or had more offerings, um, instead of having a um, varsity and JV had an A, B, C, D, E, F sides, you know, had appropriate funding to do that, then, you know, it'd sort of take away the pressure for people to have to specialize. They could, hey, I want, I want to go out for baseball and I'm going to join the D side and see how it goes. And yeah. the natural athlete will probably take to it and, and rise the, up the ranks. And maybe the coaches will find that they have a larger pool of athletes to work with. And all of a sudden they're, they're, they're better than they would have been otherwise. Yeah. I mean, in the end, you can practice a sport all you want, but if you're not athletic, you're going to hit a ceiling. 
And um, I, would, I remember doing a, a talk for um, one of our reps was a professional baseball player. And a rep is someone who sells orthopedic equipment. And I, I gave a talk at one of his baseball academies. And I said, you know, I don't know if you really want me to do this because I'm going to tell people not to play baseball year round. I'm going to tell them to take a break. He goes, actually, I really want you to say this. I, I think the parents need to hear it from you. I've been saying this all along. And then afterwards, we talked. I said, so do you think, you know, we're making better baseball players by the kids training year round? And he said, no, I don't. What we're doing is getting the kids better at a younger age and they reach their max potential at a younger age, but their potential would be greater if they were becoming better athletes by playing more sports. And so he feels that it is stunting the athleticism of the kids by specializing in a single sport that overall they would become much better athletes if they were playing multiple sports. And when you think at the professional level, there's that video of Steve Nash, the former point guard, the Hall of Fame point guard, um, for the Suns and the Lakers. He was an incredible soccer player. And if you go to a, a Hawks game and you watch warm-ups and you see the guys in the, in the tunnel with a soccer ball, where they juggle a soccer ball among five guys, the ball never touches the ground, doesn't bang up against the ceiling. These guys are tremendously athletic, not just in hockey. And so, I, I, again, I think athleticism trumps everything. And if you want to develop the best athlete, you probably do it by exposing him to multiple types of sports as opposed to doing the single sport year round. I agree. I mean, Jordan too was the same way. Baseball. A good enough baseball player. I mean, yeah. he didn't make it, but yeah. to play in the minor leagues is still a pretty good baseball player. Yeah. Tony Romo is an amazing golfer too. He's trying to go pro and now. I think Drew Brees beat um, Andy Roddick in tennis. Like, 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 like these guys are just tremendous athletes. Yeah. So um, I agree. Yeah. Oh, that's, so that, that that's what you really are hoping to develop and. Again, for the kids themselves, I can't imagine playing the same sport year round, year after year after year. As a kid, I'd get bored, burn out, and that's exactly what we see. The burnout rate and the participation rate really plummets in the high school years. Yeah. And what you really like to see high school is when you want to start really introducing kids into sports and mm -hmm. developing lifelong patterns of physical activity and, 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 and fun through sports. So um, I think we have our work cut out for us as parents and um Actually, I think what will happen is the kids who are growing up now think, realize that what was done to them was crazy, and they'll be better parents than we are. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. You learn. you got to go yeah. through it, and, right. then, and then you learn. No, and I mean, that's part of our, our, our goal with this podcast is more education. Bring on people like you to spread the word like that. Hopefully somebody hears this and takes a little nugget from it and implements it into their life. So no, I hope that, so. That's good. I, it, it, that Youth Sports Injury website, StopSportsInjuries.org, really is a tremendous resource okay. for parents and for kids. And so um, if I could put a plug in, yeah. that's the plug um, for injury prevention for youth sports. I like that. I like that. Um, as we wrap up here, I always like to ask for some advice. So we've covered a lot of topics here. Um, I guess, is there anything that you want to share with the listeners on, I guess, living a healthier life, maybe injury prevention, things we could be doing every day to kind of prevent some of these injuries that you see? So um, I'm going to go back to that recovery theme. Okay. And so... Um, Again, if you start focusing on your recovery, if you're someone who wants to work out every day, then working out for three hours would be tough to get complete recovery before the next day. So um, if you do work out on a daily basis, you're going to want to vary your workouts in such a way that you're not overtaxing a single muscle group. Um, vary, uh, maybe um, uh, intensify the workouts and shorten the time so that, again, you can be sufficiently recovered for the next, next workout. Uh, sleep is a big part of that recovery. And there's sort of a machismo around sleep, you know, such as I can sleep when I'm dead. But getting proper sleep is really important for the body to recover. And there's some very good studies looking at sleep and athletic performance. And the athletes who get more sleep perform better. And um, again, this is sort of that, um, that's why this emphasis on some of these wearable apps is around. Um, there was a study done at Stanford uh, where they took the men's basketball team and they had the players intentionally sleep more. And Stanford has a very robust sleep program, so they've been studying sleep for a while. And their free throw percentage went up by 9%, and their three-point percentage went up by 9%. Their overall healthy happiness quotient went up by a lot. So just by sleeping more, it was a performance enhancer. So I think if people start turning themselves on to better sleep and using that as a performance enhancer, um, they'll do a lot for their, for their injury prevention, they'll do a lot for their performance. I love that. Those are perfect, very easy things mm -hmm. that we can control yes. every day. I, I love it. Um, well, hey, I want to thank you again for being on the show. 
My I pleasure. Wanna, I want to commend you on the work that you do every day to get people back to a normal life. I think it's awesome. Um, and again, educating people to you doing stuff like this, I think is huge for the general public. Right. So you know, we, we have a general goal in orthopedic surgery, which is to perform, have the need to perform zero surgeries. I mean, that would be the ideal where we prevent all of these injuries. And um, I don't think we'll ever get to that. Obviously, things do happen. But that should be our goal as orthopedic surgeons is to prevent all of these injuries from happening. But we do fortunately have the ability and the technology to um, um, help patients salvage from these injuries and recover from these injuries and get back to performing at a peak level. So, um, you know, I'm very in a very privileged position to be able to do something like that. And I always enjoy coming on uh, these type of venues to discuss um, uh, some of these tips that might be helpful. Um, I see patients one at a time. But these type of podcasts can reach out to hundreds of people, and so I'm happy to yeah. do it. If people want to learn more about Illinois Bone and Joint Institute or more about you, where can they go to do that? So online is the, our best resource. Um, we have a website at www.ibji.com. Um, we have physician profiles for all of us. Um, they can obviously tap on my page and get a little bit more of my background and, and, and hear some of the stories that I have to tell and look at some of the research that I've done. I love it. I love it. Yeah. We'll make sure that we link that up when we go to post this on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. We'll put a link in there uh, so that they can research that. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for being on. Thank you. Uh, I want to give a special shout out one more time to our sponsors, uh, Team Motivate in You and Eco Gym. Make sure you guys go check them out. Until next week, thanks a lot for being on.